Good morning and welcome to the FSR webinar entitled Gas Tariff Regulation in a Competitive and Shrinking Market that will be today presented by Sergio Ascari, who is Senior Consultant at REFI in Milan and Gas Advisor at Florence Curve Regulation. Since this is our first webinar of 2013, I would like to wish you a Happy New Year. My name is Magdalena Mosh and I'm a Training Coordinator at Florence Curve Regulation and I will be also moderating today's webinar. And before we will connect with our today's speaker, I would like to point out a couple of issues regarding the webinar agenda. So the first point is the introduction. So this is exactly what I'm doing right now. In this point, I will also very briefly explain the control panel that you can see in the upper right corner of your computer screen. Then we will connect with our today's speaker to proceed with his presentation. Right after, that, right after that, there will be time for Q&A. In this section, uh, Sergio Ascari will reply for the questions submitted by the audience, and I will explain how you can submit your questions in just a couple of seconds. And then the last point are the conclusions. So I will conclude this webinar with some final announcements. Okay, so this is the control panel that you can see right now on your computer screen. I would like to briefly explain a couple of features of this control panel. So the first one is this uh, little orange arrow. So uh, if you would like to follow today's webinar on your full computer screen, you just have to click on this button here and the control panel will be minimized in, and it will remain on your computer screen. However, if you would like to use some of the other features of the control panel, you can always click in the same place and it will reopen once again. However, if you would like to check something on your computer or something on the internet, you can click on uh, the button below to minimize the window because uh, this will allow you to remain connected to the webinar, but this with the whole webinar will be minimized and the webinar icon will remain on your taskbar. Okay, the next uh, button is the hand rise tool. So this is the tool that I would like you to use right now. Therefore, if you can hear me and if you can see my presentation, please click here and I will know that everything is fine and that we can proceed to the further parts of the webinar. I am checking right now. I can see that many of you have voted. Thank you very much for being so active. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, however, if you have any technical problems right now or if you will have any technical issues during the webinar, you can always use the question box. So this is the place here below. This is also a place where you can submit your questions to Sergio Ascari. Therefore, you can submit your questions during the webinar. Uh, however, let me just point out that uh, we have a very limited time for the Q&A. Therefore, if you could uh, submit a very brief questions, that will help us to answer for more questions. Uh, however, yeah, so this is the most important things about the control panel. Let me just say that the uh, PDF from today's webinar and also the recording will be available on our website on Friday and also the recording will be available on our YouTube channel also this Friday. Okay, so now it's time to connect with our today's speaker with Sergio. So I am unmuting Sergio right now. Good morning, Sergio. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning, Madalena, and good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being with us today. I will right now switch to your computer screen, and in this way we will be able to proceed with your presentation. This will take a couple of seconds. Uh, I think that right now you can already turn it on. Okay, okay. so Perfect. here we are leaving. with yes. this, uh, today's topic. I am leaving you the floor. I will come uh, back again in 40 minutes. Okay. So, uh, welcome to this webinar. This is a hot issue, uh, really, because we are uh, talking uh, quite a lot uh, about uh, gas tariff regulation, especially transmission tariff regulation uh, nowadays in Europe. Uh, also, as I will show you, this uh, issue is uh, important for gas uh, distribution tariffs. Uh, I'll try to persuade you how important this is. But uh, uh, this topic has not been very fashionable for a number of years, honestly. Uh, until about 10 years ago, uh, tariff regulation was uh, 
I would say, the my, by far the most important issue in uh, uh, electricity and gas regulation. I would say that 90% of all regulatory issues were um, tariff issues until uh, 10 years ago, and that's still the case in uh, uh, other parts uh, of the world where markets have not opened yet. But since the market uh, opened, uh, market rules have become the most important issues, and tariffs have been regarded as a rather, I would say, uh, traditional issue where um, most uh, changes had already occurred until, say, the end of the 1990s, uh, and uh, nothing really new happened. There was a consolidated traditional view, which I would like to summarize very briefly, uh, that will help us to discuss the further issues. Basically, the traditional view is that regulators should set the allowed revenue uh, of transmission system operators. Uh, I'm not discussing how this is done, this is a long topic, but it's not for today. And the tariff structure uh, is supposed to reflect the cost structure as much as possible. That means that fixed cost uh, of uh, the TSO should be mostly raised by uh, fixed tariffs. And what is a fixed tariff is normally a capacity related tariff component. Um, these tariff components are in fact uh, covering normally 90-95% uh, and there has been a certain tendency to move towards this uh, approach in Europe, although not uh, all regulators still uh, adopt it. Next important issue, the only really important change in the last 10 years has been the move towards entry-exit tariffs, which is now, with the third package, is now mandatory in the European Union. And the entry-exit tariff system for transmission, or at least for the bulk of transmission, is a tariff system where Capacity tariffs uh, are defined for each entry point into the system and for each exit point into the system, but uh, tariffs are independent from the path uh, through uh, across the system from the entry to the exit. So each entry has a tariff which is independent of the exit and vice versa. Uh, where there is still an important choice is between two approaches about the allowed revenue. One approach is to have a revenue cap. Uh, under a revenue cap approach, uh, basically the revenue is guaranteed for the TSO. That means that if demand fluctuates, for example, demand is lower than expected because there is a, a less uh, capacity booking than expected, uh, then unit tariffs must be adjusted. Uh, of course, when there is an allowed revenue, the actual tariff uh, structure is made of uh, unit tariff, for example, a capacity tariff for a certain entry point. If demand is lower, then, uh, of course, uh, that unit tariff, lower than expected, that unit tariff is not enough to cover uh, the allowed revenue. And so that tariff should be adjusted uh, upwards, and the opposite, of course, happens if uh, uh, more demand uh, uh, comes about than expected. Uh, under a revenue cap approach, there is some adjustment and maybe at a later stage where uh, this uh, uh, mistake is corrected, is fixed, so that uh, uh, overall, maybe over, uh, I would say, moving average uh, over several years, uh, uh, the TSO revenue are guaranteed. The other approach, which is not uh, the dominant approach in Europe, is the pure price cap, where these unit tariffs uh, are not adjusted. So that if there is a, there are demand fluctuations, that risk falls on the TSO. In that case, transmission is a more risky business, of course, and because uh, the risk of demand fluctuation falls on the TSO. Now, how the, is this a, a picture change by the integration of the gas market? Let me uh, highlight a few features. That's not an exhaustive list of issues, but it's only a selection of issues which are, in my view, uh, very important for uh, tariff setting. 
first point is that uh, with the third packet, TSOs are more and more unbundled from suppliers. Most of them are bundled by ownership, others are unbundled by the independent transmission operators approach, but in any case, um, most of them are now clearly unbundled from supply interest, and as a consequence of which their priorities and strategies will definitely not be as in the last decade. They will have different approaches and maybe uh, there will be more active uh, people, more active uh, partners of the European gas industry than they have been in the last decade. Second thing, second feature is very well known uh, feature. Most grass crosses borders, unlike in electricity. Uh, only 3% of electricity crosses borders in Europe, but about 60% of gas uh, does. So, uh, as a consequence of which, there are uh, important, uh, I would say, um, there are important. Uh, sorry. I'm going too fast. Uh, there are important uh, reasons for consolidation of uh, uh, the transmission industry. Uh, there may be uh, synergies in the management of uh, transmission across several transmission system operators and across border. And this is already uh, favoring uh, uh, some. Uh, mergers, consolidation, and also, I would say, alliances between uh, different transmission system operators, much in the same ways as there have been uh, significant alliances as well as mergers uh, among the old uh, incumbents in the airline industry. Uh, some limited competition is always there between routes. For example, uh, there are, just as an example, there are at least four different ways, maybe there will be more, to transport uh, natural gas from Russia to Germany. And also there will be other, way, other routes where gas could be brought into Germany. And the same happens in many other, for many other countries. So uh, there, are, there is competition, some competition at least, between routes and also between supply facilities, not only pipelines, but of course LNG terminals as well. Thirdly, it's a quite different issue, but it's a, it's a regulatory issue, there will be new capacity allocation criteria. The capacity allocation network code for Europe is now almost ready, and it's clear that it will involve auctions as a way of allocating capacity for uh, interconnection points and also maybe for other points of the networks. That will uh, entail some uncertainty about uh, capacity about uh, uh, capacity sales, and that may lead to revenue and the recovery, and so uh, the issue I was mentioning of guaranteed, guaranteeing uh, revenues uh, may not be an easy one, even if some people in the industry and in the regulation always think that uh, this should be done, but may be difficult and serious problem may occur with under or over recovery. That's what most people uh, among you, especially those who work with TSOs, uh, are rather concerned about, I would say. Okay. Uh, but let me look at this uh, uh, in market integration from a different perspective. I would look at it from a a regulatory perspective, and let me look at it uh, at, uh, with a European regulatory perspective rather than national one. Because uh, if we, we must consider that if, the, if there are uh, important flows across borders, uh, well, let me uh, rather frankly explain what is the big risk. The big risk is that it may be in the interest of transit countries, uh, the countries where gas doesn't stop but just flows on to other countries to exploit these transit flows. This is a very old story. One way to do it could be just to charge high transmission prices, relatively high transmission prices, and compensate domestic customers by lower taxes. If you, if you follow this approach and if uh, most of gas uh, uh, which is used, which is uh, transported in uh, the t by the TSO of the country, is actually for 
uh, other countries use, then this approach could be a winning approach for uh, the transit country. And the national regulatory authorities may well collude with such behavior because it is consistent with the national interest and they have no responsibility to protect the customers of other countries, after all. Uh, let me say that, uh, uh, well, the evidence is not conclusive of this point, but as far as I know, I could mention uh, the KMAREC study of 2009, which is available on the European Commission website, uh, you may notice that, uh, um, you may notice that uh, this uh, uh, approach actually is doesn't seem to be followed, but maybe more thorough analysis would be, ne would be needed to understand because uh, it's a highly technical issue and it's not easy to, 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 to detect uh, this behavior uh, at first glance, I mean at a glance. Um, in any case, the revenue level or price level uh, determination is now clearly beyond the scope of EU regulation or even harmonization. Um, we know, we all know that tariff setting involves some subjective judgment. Uh, it's not easy to challenge an exploitative regulation because uh, there are many combinations of uh, uh, decision to be taken according to, uh, about the regulatory asset base, about the rate of returns and so on, so that it's very easy, may, I mean, it's very difficult to detect uh, if uh, behave, a certain regulatory behavior is going to exploit, uh, for example, uh, cross-border flows. By the way, this could be a case for more consolidation of the industry. If a downstream uh, country, or maybe the industry for that is countries, fear being exploited by a transit country, they may try the uh, they may try to just uh, uh, merge with the industry of the transit country, that is to buy the uh, TSO uh, as a way of hedging their risks. Now let me move to tariff structure. Tariff structure may be also used to discriminate against cross-border flows and all what I've just said uh, could apply just as well. But the main difference is that uh, for tariff structure the discrimination is explicitly forbidden by Article 13 of the gas uh, transmission or regulation uh, in the third package. Uh, look, this discrimination is forbidden, but in fact the technicalities, especially the technicalities of the entry exit tariff determination, could be used to allocate view, to allocate the cost in such a way, for example, to favor domestic customers over cross-border flows again. And that's exactly what uh, the, uh, the framework guidelines of the Tariff Structure Network Code are trying to avoid. Uh, these uh, framework guidelines are uh, under discussion. Just now there will be a workshop in Brussels and in Ljubljana, which will be interconnected for that. Um, in just two days, so it's very hot issue and uh, these uh, uh, framework guidelines are uh, under discussion just now. Um, now, uh, it could be argued, somebody could argue that uh, there should be no difference in tariff setting criteria by different uh, regulatory authorities, whether uh, this is uh, for the level of structure or the tactile uh, the structure or the, the, the structure of tariffs. Sorry. Uh, for example, in the U.S. and in Canada, the long-distance tariffs are set by a federal authority. Of course, if you have the same judge, you can uh, more easily think that uh, there is more justice rather than having national judges. Uh, but that's not the case in Europe for tariff level, and it's only partly the case for. Um, tariff structure. So, uh, what's happening in for tariff structure at least? The tariff, as I told you, there is a framework guideline uh, being discussed. It will shape the tariff European network code, tariff structure European network code. Um, and uh, uh, currently, uh, the, the, the draft under discussion requires some main, some main 
provision, there are some main provisions uh, which justify exceptions allowed in order to reduce uh, or to uh, eliminate uh, this uh, type of discrimination. First of all is the transparency of cost allocation which is required. We'll see how the network code will actually require transparency of cost allocation. As I told you there are other technical issues and uh, here even more than in other uh, many other issues I would say that the devil is in the details and so we'll have to see how many details will be shown. Uh, secondly, uh, the um, framework Ghana requires that the distance should be recognized as the major cost allocation driver. Uh, in gas transmission, distance is indeed the major driver, of course, it goes with capacity. Volume is not a major driver for most uh, costs, but uh, distance is, so it should be recognized in the approaches that are followed. And the third very important point is that, uh, which is under discussion, is to have a 50-50 uh, split uh, of the cost between the entries and the exits. Of course, uh, normally, with some exceptions, but normally um, cross-border flows involve a greater distance, and uh, so if you put too much cost on the exits, uh, that is a way of uh, mm, putting uh, maybe uh, more uh, cost uh, onto the uh, long distance uh, flows, that is more cost on the borders. This is not necessarily a mm, fair allocation and this is a point which is highly, which is a uh, thoroughly dis being discussed now. Uh, finally, there is a general approach that the same methodology should be used for the cost allocation to all entry and exit points, uh, whether they are domestic or international. Yet, uh, the guideline does not prescribe a single harmonized cost allocation methodology. There are now three, four different methodologies being used in Europe and they are all allowed, uh, only w once you have chosen the methodology, you should use it for all um, issues. Okay, now I've spoken uh, enough uh, and I think I have uh, I tried to uh, single out the problems uh, of uh, uh, integration for tariffs. At this point, maybe I have not been very fair, I may have been very uh, a little bit biased, I hope uh, to have been fair, you will see. Mm. But, uh, and so let me, let me listen now to your opinion. Let me invite you to a poll we have prepared. And the first poll I am pr proposing to you is uh, uh, who should take decision about cross-border transmission tariffs. Uh, it could be, for example, an uh, EU level authority. So should we do like the US and move to a tariff regulation for long distance transmission at least to a federal level authority like the ACER, much as monetary policy has been moved to a European Central Bank. Second approach is that uh, uh, the national regulator should still decide but some harmonization of uh, tariff criteria should be, uh, should be adopted. A third approach could be that uh, only the harmonization of tariff structures is needed, but not the harmonization of tariff level criteria, tariff level decision criteria, which is basically what is uh, the current approach now. The, and the fourth approach, uh, I would say, is that even that harmonization is not needed and all decision could be uh, left uh, to national regulatory authorities, as was the case before. Uh, the third package uh, started to be implemented. Okay, so um, let me ask you if you wish to uh, uh, vote on uh, this poll. I have now launched the poll and you should be able to vote. Yes, I see that you are voting already. Okay, I see it's a rather technical issue. Uh, no, but more of you are voting now. Yeah, excellent. Uh, I see that about three quarters of you are have already voted. Uh, I think I can close the poll now as time is rather short. I'm now closing the poll. 
And uh, let me share with you the results of this poll. Uh, well, very, very interesting results uh, because uh, uh, here uh, what I see is the current approach is only endorsed by 4% of you. Uh, maybe, of course, I was biased and I managed to influence your decisions. I hope not, but uh, I see that uh, about 80% of you would, would like to see more um, harmonization, that's uh, actually uh, the, the winning uh, solution, and e many of you, about 40% of you, are even ready to have tar uh, transmission tariffs decided at the EU level. That, I think, is quite interesting result. Uh, good. Thank you for uh, taking part in this uh, first poll, and let me now move uh, move on uh, with my presentation. I would like now to address the second part. Is uh, uh, as I told you, we are facing a integrating gas market, but also a changing gas market. Why? We know that there is a renewable energy takeoff. There is a focus on efficiency. And all of this is limiting gas demand growth, notably for market, for power generation. Mm, gas, uh, and this, uh, uh, well, uh, the gas role may be evolving towards uh, a simple backup of renewables in power generation with a smaller, so very swinging demand. Also, we are facing a temporary, maybe temporary, but uh, we don't know, recovery of the coal market share for a number of very interesting reasons I have no time to address. There are low carbon emission prices, cheap US coal exports, so a rather low price of coal. So ironically, the EU is, uh, has the most aggressive policy towards global warming in principle, but in fact, the EU has, is uh, now producing more emission because it's using more coal, while the US are using less coal and reducing their emission. And that's a rather ironic uh, situation, which uh, somebody expects to, to last with gas market demand uh, expected to decline or stagnate. And let me see now uh, we have seen, uh, we can see what's happening in the first uh, half of uh, 2012 with gas demand sharply declining in many important markets and only a few countries uh, are seeing their uh, gas demand increase. So, uh, with uh, uh, what could happen to gas infrastructure? Because that could there could be uh, consequences for gas infrastructure pricing. In fact, uh, even if uh, gas demand uh, will decline or stagnate in Europe, yet infrastructure will be needed anyway because uh, we'll need infrastructure to cope with the backup role of transportation uh, of gas, sorry, and also we'll need the infrastructure to transport gas from new supply sources because if demand is declining or may decline, everybody agrees that uh, uh, production will decline at least for the four, five, six, uh, for the next five, six years until possibly uh, shale gas comes, uh, comes online, but we don't know about that, so the co we don't, we expect uh, uh, new infrastructure needed anyway, and uh, the combination of uh, less demand and more infrastructure is that lower load factors must be expected from infrastructure. And everybody knows that with lower load factors for infrastructure, higher costs are coming about. So, um, what happening in the gas market. What are the consequences of such changing markets for uh, gas transmission tariffs? Now, tariffs, as I told you, are approved by the NRAs, and there are strict principles about cost accounting criteria and about the tariff structure, which uh, follow more, I would say, accounting criteria and principles rather than market opportunities. This is not what happening. what happens normally in competing industry. Uh, in competing industries where there are joint costs, for example, in significant network costs, that is the case of natural gas transmission and distribution, 
of course, and distribution. Uh, in such cases, uh, uh, companies normally allocate cost and inverse relation to the market demand. Sorry for this uh, economics uh, theorem, uh, which I'm showing you very quickly, but basically companies uh, tend to allocate more cost where um, demand is less reactive. Uh, so to those uh, sectors, and that happens in all industry. We, you can consider a number of industry you are facing every day where this happens, and there's nothing bad about this. It's just the market. Uh, but it may be at odds with the fairness criteria, which are required by national regulators. Um, so. If you wanted to have a more efficient tariff structure, this should be proposed by the transmission system operators and distributors rather than imposed by the NRAs. Uh, we all know that in competitive industry, tariffs are very important. Let's just think about how tariffs are used in the tel telecommunication or the airline industry or any industry that has liberalized. So, uh, there may be a trade-off, there may be a conflict between the efficiency criteria, uh, which would be required by a more competitive uh, role uh, uh, of the industry, and the equity, which may be required by the regulators. Uh, so, uh, TSO may need more flexibility. They want to, to compete, uh, as I told you, with the competition between routes, between fuels, the competition which may be here. Uh, now, before we go on, I would like to stop a little uh, for a minute and ask you a rather provocative issue. Sorry, it seems that I'm totally changing the topic, but you will see in the next slide how this is important, because we are now talking about energy mix, uh, we are talking about energy sources, and there are different approaches to this. So I have another poll here, which is a very general uh, poll, I understand, but uh, let me share it with you if you wish to answer, to give your uh, position on this. My poll, my issue is very, very general, is who should take decision about uh, energy sources? Should that be markets, but somebody thinks markets are too short-sighted and national government should decide? Others think that uh, uh, the decision about the energy mix should be even at the EU level because even uh, national governments are too small, too short-sighted, short-sighted in space, maybe not in time, but short-sighted for the for a proper energy mix for Europe. And the third approach is uh, rather different. Somebody thinks uh, that. Uh, uh, markets should decide, and so we, governments should only internalize the internal cost, for example, set up an efficient uh, system for uh, um, sorry, the, an efficient emission trading system, decide how, ma how many emissions should be cut, and let the markets decide through this mechanism, or perhaps use more environmental taxes, but not uh, directly intervene into the decision about the policy mix. Um, finally, uh, somebody could think that uh, you and or government should define the fuel mix, but leave the markets to select the sources and the routes uh, uh, rather than uh, rather than deciding. Let me ask you your position, uh, your opinion about this. Here I have launched the poll, and I see you voting. Okay, three quarters of you have already voted, so I think that I will close the poll now. Let me close the poll and show you the results. Uh, I see that there is a fair majority in favor of some uh, of some uh, market role in the uh, decisions. So, uh, well, in fact, uh, the most market-oriented uh, answer, which was answer three, uh, is uh, uh, shared by 30% of you. But still, we see some 30% uh, of you under question uh, on solution three and 
40% the winning uh, answer, which uh, uh, still sees uh, an important role of markets in the selection of sources and routes. And this is, uh, in a sense, interesting for what we are going to see in the next question, because in the, the next slide, sorry, because uh, we are now, uh, uh, I will now show you how this uh, uh, point is important for for the uh, issues of tariff regulation. There are different views on the impact of a changing market uh, as it's ch the market, gas market is changing on tariff regulation. Somebody thinks that tariff regulation will just not be very important after the third package is implemented. And there are two main reasons. One reason is that, of course, the markets are important, but all what we need uh, can be achieved by the adjusting the gas market prices. I mean, the suppliers can adjust the market prices in line with what the market requires and what with efficiency requires, but transmission tariffs uh, are a limited part of the gas price, maybe only 10% on average, so uh, and even less for some countries. So uh, it's uh, not very important to 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 leave these uh, tariffs, uh, uh, to use these tariffs for for the gas market competition. And moreover, uh, we know that uh, with the capacity and location network code, uh, actual prices will be actually defined by the auctions and tariffs are only used as reserve prices. So overall, there is not much to change in tariff regulation after the third package is implemented. And there's another view which will tell you that a transmission is an important part of the gas uh, value chain, of the gas business. These are big companies, uh, they have an important role, we have seen that they are changing their behavior, they have new strategies, new perspectives, and they cannot be left out of the competition. They cannot be become bureaucracies. Uh, if a competition, if there is new competition from coal, and if we agree, uh, we have seen that not all of you agree on that, that, but if we agree that competition from coal and renewables will be tough, and such competition must be played by the gas industry, and if that is the case, all parts of the value chain must be involved, and, and transmission cannot be left out of the competition. And let me add, sorry for not uh, writing this in the, in the slide, but let me tell you that the same applies to distribution. Actually, uh, I can say that in most cases, uh, uh, regulators are uh, more available to leave more freedom to distribution rather than transmission capacity to allocate costs, for example, in a market reflective way rather than cost reflective way. But uh, uh, that's not the case everywhere. And if we consider, if you add the transmission and distribution cost, then it's more than 10% of the gas price. And it's very difficult to leave not only transmission, but also distribution out of the competition. <laughs> and another point that these um, views uh, hold is that in most cases, the, it's true that auctions will decide the reserve prices, but given the limited uh, uh, congestion, in many cases, actually, uh, reserve prices will matter a lot, so transmission tariffs will still matter a lot. Okay, now time is tight, so I will uh, go straight to the third and final poll. I'll try to show you why, uh, in my view, uh, some more free regulation, I've, again, I've been biased, uh, uh, but uh, hopefully I have also shown you the different perspective uh, on uh, tariff uh, transmission, so on transmission tariff uh, uh, regulation. Uh, now I ask you, can the traditional tariff model uh, survive in the new market setting? Uh, somebody could think, uh, yes, uh, no major changes are needed. Others may say that uh, transmission system of AETO should be given more freedom to adjust tariff structure, to, be, to have more re market responsive tariff structure, yet tariff regulation is still needed, and in particular the level of tariff should, be, should still be decided, should decided by regulators. Other 
could say that uh, uh, there is so much competition between fuels and between routes that it's not necessary to have transmission regulation, transmission tariff regulation at all. So that uh, transmission tariff regulation could be phased out and uh, um, and uh, quite simply, or for example, tariffs could be like in America, they, they could be kept at a rather high level, so uh, I mean the regulated tariffs, because we all know, because uh, competition will actually keep them down, that's what's happening in the US, tariffs are regulated, but in fact the real tariffs are below, because there is competition between uh, transmission companies. The fourth approach the fourth, uh, could be that uh, uh, even more radical, say, no, noticing that uh, gas is going to be phased out, uh, uh, not regulation, but gas itself is going to be phased out. In the long term, uh, uh, some countries are already planning the elimination of gas, except perhaps as a backup fuel, as I told you, as a reserve fuel. So, uh, in this situation, the cost of transmission, gas transmission, will be so high that TSO will no longer be able to survive as uh, market-oriented companies. They will become like, uh, I would say, the road suppliers, uh, um, more like public goods, uh, which can only survive with uh, tariff support, sorry, with uh, government support. Uh, let me ask you your opinion about this. Okay, good. I see that this time uh, your opinion is uh, much more clear-cut than the previous cases. Uh, maybe you have learned uh, to vote uh, more quickly, now you are experienced voters in the webinar. Uh, but maybe your opinion is much more clear-cut and I see that there is an overwhelming majority. Let me close the polls now and uh, let me show you the results. You see that uh, uh, more than three quarters of you, that is an overwhelming majority, support the idea that uh, TSO should be uh, more free to adjust tariff structure. Re yet regulation is still necessary, so TSO should be part of the competitive business, should be more free to adjust the restructure than they are now, uh, but regulation is necessary, still necessary, competition is not enough pro to protect consumers and or particular transmission users from, uh, from uh, the risk of uh, market power abuse, for example. Uh, very interesting results, and now I think I have to move quickly toward the end. Um, yes, so we can move quickly toward the conclusion of this uh, of my presentation. There is actually another um, another slide which I have to skip. It's about the problem of. Uh, of, I would say revenue support for transit countries facilities, transit countries pipelines. Uh, there was a traditional way of covering the cost of transit capacity. In the current market arrangement, this may be a problem. Everybody agrees in principle that there are mecha there may be mechanisms for the support of this capacity. Yet in practice, this solution have not been implemented, and this is a serious uh, problem, not a serious theoretical problem, but it's a serious practical problem. I have no time to discuss it further, maybe there will be questions about that. Let me go to the conclusions. Uh, so as I notice, uh, uh, tariffs uh, used to be a fashionable topic, not much in the last decade, now more fashionable again. Mm. There are many objectives, on not only of efficiency, but also security of supply, sustainability, all of these involve externalities which should be included in the market framework by, the suit, by suitable means. This, uh, on, uh, it happens, this happens to, uh, to require the preservation of some national control on network regulated tariffs. Uh, uh, and energy policy making uh, as well are seen as crucial in several countries. But, uh, this may 
uh, be at odds to some uh, extent with uh, the goals of uh, uh, integrating uh, the European market, especially in a situation where there is more competition from other sources. So we have seen there are several ways, views. If you think that energy policy is mostly national government responsibility, you could be happy with the current development, including uh, involving limited tariff harmonization, mostly national decision, and strict regulatory control of TSOs. But if you think uh, that the EU should have a larger role in energy policy, then you may want to give more tariff responsibility to the European level with the close monitoring of NRAs uh, as an intermediate step because the more harmonization of tariff approaches should be uh, necessary. Uh, thirdly, if you think that market rather government should decide the energy mix, or at least uh, to be more precise, at least the energy, the uh, energy sources uh, which are used to achieve a certain energy mix and the routes, then you may prefer to relax regulatory control on TSOs We have you to them taking a more active role as part of the gas industry and also in the promotion of innovation, including the tariff dimension, which is so, in a sense, becoming very important again. And uh, if I can uh, uh, quickly summarize uh, your, uh, even, sorry, of course, this slide was written before your polls. I should modify, I just uh, it a little bit, uh, but if I, I could say that uh, considering your poll, this final view seems to be supported by the majority of you. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm open for questions and answers. Thank you very much, Sergio, for your presentation. And let me just uh, point out that right now on this last slide, you can see the email of Sergio Ascari. And uh, be because we have a very limited time for the Q&A, therefore, if you will have any questions uh, for Sergio after the webinar, or maybe your question won't be asked during the Q&A, you can use this email and you can contact Sergio directly after the webinar. Uh, okay, so let's just very quickly go to the Q&A. Uh, there have been several questions submitted. So the first question will be, are there other tariff issues from market integration besides the exploitation of transit flows? Should I answer now? Yes, please. Yes. Well, um, I think that the main issue, the, the, the other main issue is what I've shown very quickly in uh, one of the last slides uh, where I was short of time. But uh, that, I would say, the main issue. The issue is the issue of cross-border uh, infrastructure. It's very important. I keep uh, uh, feeling in several, I've tra been traveling through several EU member states and found that in many, I mean, in several countries, there are complaints beca because uh, basically your neighbor's regulators does not uh, like, uh, for example, the development of infrastructure uh, which is used by your country. Uh, and uh, there are very tight criteria for the development of infrastructure. And, of course, uh, the, the neighbor's regulator, uh, let me go back to this slide, um, is concerned because uh, in the end, uh, because at the end, uh, transmission in the neighboring country, transmission in the neighboring countries is, has a cost which may fall on the customers of that country, of the transit country. And of course, the regulators are worried because they don't want to allow cost which could be borne uh, sooner or later by uh, their customer's country, even if the, such costs were um, incurred because of another country. So we have this, still, this mechanism for cross-border sharing of costs, uh, which is not, uh, mm, not, well, uh, not well designed. Uh, everybody agrees there should be a mechanism, for example, cost uh, capacity could be purchased on long term by, an, by a downstream TSO. Uh, 
but this solution has not been implemented. I mean, simply no TSO is, is currently almost no TSO, as far as I know, is currently paying for the cost of another TSOs. So that's, uh, I would say, the most important issue besides uh, the implement, besides the risk of uh, exploitation of uh, cross-border flows. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next question will be, the second question will be, which market actors would be more affected by countries' disagreements or disar disharmonization? Uh, well, which country actors... The, uh, I would say it, it depends because uh, actually there are different settings and you know that some TSO are still controlled by national government is directly or indirectly other TSOs are controlled by actually by international gas companies even if most gas suppliers are now in a sense uh, um, giving up the control of network so this is a it's not a clear issue who could g gain. In some cases, uh, you could even have the opposite case, that is, uh, uh, domestic customers exploited by, by cross-border flows. Uh, I would say that given the control of national regulatory authority, this is a lower risk, but uh, the opposite cannot be excluded uh, in principle. Mm -hmm. And the next question is, in the new market environment, most of the investment decisions seems to be bound to be taken by national regulatory authorities instead of the market. What's your view on this point? Well, again, this is a very difficult issue because, uh, for example, in electricity, and uh, by the way, there will be, I think, an interesting webinar by my friend Leonardo Meus on this issue about the role of cost benefit analysis because of course if decisions are taken by a regulator they normally would use cost benefit analysis. Uh, now my problem as a practitioner of cost benefit analysis is that I know there is again some subjective judgment uh, in, cross in cost benefit analysis. So that's far from perfect. Uh, and that is the main risk uh, because, as I told you, if uh, companies decide, sorry, if regulators decide with a national uh, approach in their mind, uh, that could lead to the shrinking of uh, capacity, which is, by the way, what uh, handbooks or regulation normally foresee. They, they are always afraid. I mean, they, they see, you know, the, the risk of monopolist is market power abuse. The risk of regulator is uh, uh, reduction of investment because uh, investment uh, in uh, facilities like networks brings about uh, uh, results uh, in the long term. But in the long term, another regulator will be in office or another government, and that's a big risk. Because, uh, of course, if uh, as a consequence of a uh, too narrow regulatory approach, uh, too little infrastructure is developed now, the problem is not now. The problem is in maybe in 10 years. At that time, there will be bottlenecks. Uh, of course, if demand is going down, the, the risk is, is reduced. But even if, for, if demand is going down, and we have the very interesting case of the Slovakian TSOs, where with demand going down, they're already planning to basically shut down part of the capacity because uh, there is a, they don't see the capacity risk. So even if uh, this is a possible consequence of an approach where the on, only the national view is taken, that is a big risk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sergio, unfortunately we are running out of time and we don't have more time for answering further questions. Uh, therefore, thank you very much, Sergio, for being with us today. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I, let me thank everybody for attending this webinar and of course if you have further questions, I'm very happy to consider them uh, by email. Thank you very thank much. You. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So right now I will switch back to my computer screen. I will do it very quickly. It will take me just a couple of seconds. I think you should be able to, to see my presentation right now. So let me just proceed with final 
conclusions. And uh, just to conclude, let me say that right after I will close today's webinar, automatically on your computer screen will appear a survey. This survey is consisted of eight questions and I would really appreciate it if you could fill it out because this will help us to evaluate today's session and make some improvements in our future webinars. And like I said in the beginning of this webinar, on Friday, the PDF and the recording from today's webinar will be available on our website and the recording also on our YouTube channel. And on Friday, you will receive a follow-up email from me where I will thank you for participating in today's webinar. And you will find the link to our website to find the recording and the PDF. And also in this email, you will find the link to register for the next webinar. And the next webinar will take place on the 12th of February always at 11 a.m. and the title of this webinar will be options for a new EU energy technology policy towards 2050 what way to go and this will be presented by my colleague from Florence Curve Regulation Sophia Rooster. Sophia is this, this will be her second webinar and I'm really looking forward to it and uh, yeah so if you would like to register for this webinar you can wait until Friday until you receive the email or you can go to our website and I'm very happy to announce that we have started 2013 at the FASAR by launching our new website and this is the new website and as you can see there is the search area here so if you would like to find out maybe something more about our future webinars you can just click here the areas the programs or the type of the training that you are interested in and you will receive all the sufficient information there uh, there is also a part called videos in this section you will find all the previous recordings from our webinars so also all the old PDFs uh, therefore I would like to encourage you to to have a look on our new website and our new videos. You can see the director of Florence Curve Regulations on the main page, Jean-Michel Gauchin. And yes, so another announcement is the new training, the training specialized training course on regulation of gas markets that will take place in March. This is the new edition of this training and we have modified this training this year. Uh, this training will be now consisted of also webinars. Webinars will be the preparatory course before the residential part that will take part in Florence between the 11th and 15th of March. If you would like to receive some further information regarding this training, you can uh, check it out on our new website or you can contact me directly. And uh, just remember that the deadline to submit your application to participate in this training is the 1st of February. Okay, so this is the email, uh, my email uh, on the, your computer screen right now, so you can contact me directly if you have any questions regarding the webinars or any other trainings organized here at Florence Curve Regulation. And as we mentioned before, if you have any questions regarding the content of today's webinar, you can contact Sergio Ascari by using the email here below. Okay, and now it's time to say goodbye. Thank you very much for joining us today. I hope that you will join us once again. And until then, I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you and goodbye.